They are. Okay, uh, they're going to be bringing my board up here because I know some of you have a hard time reading, and so I'm going to draw some pictures for you today, okay? <laughs> Just for a little while. And uh, I hope you can get it on the screen. Stan will work with you before it's over. And, uh, but I hope that it will be a blessing to you. And uh, thank you, Ken. Got that. That's good. No problem. Don't worry about it. Okay. I want to talk to you. I'd like for you to do something for me. I'd like for you just to kind of open your minds up. And uh, let's just trust what God's Word says to us today, okay? I think one of the things that we often do is uh, we forget uh, the privilege we have to be a child of God today. And sometimes we even forget about our salvation experience in the sense that we live as if it's never happened in our life. And uh, Peter says something about that. I'll mention that a little bit later on. But uh, this board here is just representing uh, where we are today and the privilege we have in being in the age of grace, we call it, but in uh, the time of uh, the mystery program that we're in. If you remember that in the Old Testament, uh, God met with Abraham and started the nation of Israel. And the prophets prophesied and prophesied that Messiah would come one day and set up his kingdom. But then Moses came on the scene and the law was given to the nation of Israel because they chose that themselves. They could have chosen grace, but they said, no, we'll do whatever you want us to do, God. And as a result, they chose to follow law. Bad move. <laughs> and because nobody can keep it. It just reveals how sinful we truly are, doesn't it? And so anyway, uh, when Christ came on the earth, uh, he presented himself as the Messiah, that the kingdom of God was at hand. And when he was on the earth, he was under the law. Still that time. Matter of fact, he came to fulfill all, didn't he? And then, of course, he died on the cross, rose from the grave, and he ascended on high. And then the 12 apostles presented that kingdom offer. He said, if you will believe as a nation, Christ will return. And he will begin the new covenant with you. And he'll set up his kingdom at that time. But, of course, we know in Acts chapter 7, they rejected that. And they said, no, we don't want this man to rule over us. And the stoning of Stephen. And then... Right after that, we know that the body of Christ began. And that's when we began here. Uh, when he, uh, perhaps uh, we say 8, 9, 10, 11, right in that area, we say mid-Acts. We just say mid-Acts because there's some differences right there, but we know it's mid-Acts. And we know that the body of Christ, the gospel of grace given to Paul, the mystery program began. And then we know by the end of Acts 28 that God was completely done with Israel They've been completely set aside, and we know that God reached out to the world from that point on through the Apostle Paul, and we know that his writings are to us for today, Romans through Philemon. And then one day, we're going to be raptured up. Uh, we're going to heaven. Trump's going to sound, bam, we're in heaven, amen? We're looking for that. And then at that time, uh, after a few things that takes place, the Antichrist will sign the contract, peace contract with the nation of Israel, and then, at that time, the seven-year tribulation will begin. And that's what we're studying on Sunday nights, by the way, Revelation 8 tonight. And it's during this time that Israel will be saved. And then, Christ returns to the earth here. I uh, should have put that down. He returns then down to the earth here. And the battle of Armageddon, and he takes care and throws Satan into the bottomless pit and so on, with the prophet and the beast and so on. And then he will set up his kingdom for a thousand years and the new covenant will be in full force at that time for the people of Israel. Now that's just an overview. Now I want to just open your minds up here now a little bit. Let's just believe what God's word says. Not what your church says. Uh, not what tradition says. Not what your denomination says. But what does God say himself? Okay? That's our final authority, is it not? We say it is, but then we act like it's not. It states this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Then he says there in verse 5, Then uh, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. That's us. And into any city of the Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile, enter ye not. And then he says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he says, and as you go, preaching, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near if you as a nation would believe. 
He says in Matthew 15, 24, he says this, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Christ came to the earth, who was he sent to? He was sent to the people of Israel. And we just look over that sometimes. Because I think we always want it always to be about us when it wasn't about us at the time. And he says this then in Romans 15, 8. Paul comments on it. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the... Okay, not, not the body of Christ, not Gentiles at that time. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Back here, the Old Testament promises there. Okay, now why did he come to the nation of Israel? Because he loved the world. And he wanted the world to be saved. However, he had to do that through his nation. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 says this, Arise, shine forth thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness at the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. The nation of Israel will rise, and it was their responsibility to believe in Messiah and as a nation of Israel to reach the world then. We know that. But then Acts 7 took place, and that was the final rejection. And the nation of Israel said, no, we don't want Christ as our Messiah. We don't believe he's the Messiah. And so God temporarily set them aside at that moment, and he begins the body of Christ even, by the way, when Christ, after his resurrection in his 40 days ministry, Acts 1, 3 says this here. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 6, so you don't misunderstand what that means. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's what they knew. That's what they believed in. That's what they desired to be the end thing. But of course, we know that didn't happen. Chapter 3, Peter says this, verse 25. He says, Ye, Israel, are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And it goes on to state there that they preached the resurrection of Christ that he might sit on the throne of David. And so the Jewish people looked for that. But we know in Acts 7, they said no. So God began the body of Christ today, which we are a part. And it's interesting the way we're saved today is not like it had been prophesied for the people of Israel. Romans 11, 11 says this here. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them, Israel, to jealousy. So it's not like it was prophesied because of their rising, but God didn't forget us because Israel it was stayed in unbelief. God said, I still love you, and I want you to be saved. And so I'm starting a new program, this program right here, the mystery of Christ, the body of Christ. He says, I'm going to do that because of Israel's falling, not their rising, complete different. And he raises up one to begin to speak for all of us. Romans 11:13. he says this here, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I, Paul, am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. And so through the book of Acts there, there was like this transition period going on that God temporarily began to set Israel aside until it was concluded. It states in Acts 13, 46, he says this, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. It states in chapter 18, verse 5 and 6. He says, Silas, uh, uh, Timotheus were come from uh, Macedonia. Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And then notice the last part of the verse there. 
I will go, henceforth, I, from henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. And then he concludes the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 27. He says this, For the heart of this people, Israel, is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. However, he says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And so God goes completely, totally from that point on. Paul, from that point on, never goes to the Jew first ever again from that point on. Now, understanding that, if we don't come on the scene until the body of Christ begins, and that's for us today, when he writes certain commissions back here, a lot of people try to say that's for today. No, it's not. Because we have our own commission. For instance, the great commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What had Christ commanded them when he was on the earth? The law, he sure did. Matthew 19, verse 16 says this, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Believe in the gospel and you'll be saved. No, he doesn't say that. And he said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, huh? What did they do? Huh? They, they keep the law here. Now, is that for us today? Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 says this, For if ye forgive man their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And then he says, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If we hold something against somebody, our forgiveness is conditional. That's under law. What about us today? Romans 6, 14 says, In this period of time right here, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen? He says in Ephesians 4, 32, For us today, and be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The reason we forgive today is not to be forgiven. The reason we forgive other people today is because we have already been forgiven. There's a real difference between law and grace. Amen? And then also... The Great Commission in the book of Mark, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And by the way, that gospel is the kingdom gospel. You can't find the death, burial, and resurrection in that whatsoever. Let me say this. That sounds fine, though, even if you say, Well, that's fine. Verse 16 says this, the next verse. He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. Hope. Oh, wait a minute. Now they want baptism. Huh? You have to keep commandments. Now you have to be water baptized. And then that's not all. Verse 17, 18, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If one was truly a saved person, those would be evidences in their life. Signs and wonders. Amen? You just can't take out a verse and just say, hey, yeah, that's for me. No, what's the context there that he's even talking about? Today, it's completely different. He says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know it well. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Quite different, isn't it? And Paul even said this, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Hey, ho, ho. You know, the 12 could never say that. They were told, commanded to go baptize. Paul said, God didn't send me to baptize. Why? Because my gospel message is completely different than the message they were speaking. Amen? And then the great commission in Luke, Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. And in the prophets, he sticks true to the law. 
He states in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's important. Verse 49, and behold, I send, I send the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Spirit of God. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And after that, then he says in Acts 1.8, uh, that's not it, that's 1.18. But you, Acts 1.8 said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come up on you. And then you go, Jerusalem to Judea, see there, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, the 12 are to begin their ministry no place else except in Israel itself, the capital city that's supposed to be in the kingdom there. Israel needed to be saved first. The reason that they had to start with Israel first, but Jerusalem first, the temple was there. And the nation of Israel needed the temple of God to worship God at that point in time. Begin in Jerusalem. But of course we know they rejected that. Amen? The next great commission is John chapter 20. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And whosoever, now get this, a lot of people in the great commission forget this. And whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye shall retain, they are retained. They had the authority to be able to forgive sins. Not the power, but the authority to be able to say your sins are forgiven. You know something? We don't have that authority whatsoever. But that was for those 12. Now what about us today? What about this period of time here? And the reason I'm going through this fast because I, people are so time conscious. You just can't wait to get to your restaurant. You know what I mean? And even though this is a great truth you need to get a hold of. So just follow me, please. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us. I hope the love of Christ motivates you, compels you to go all out for him. Then he says in verse 18 for us, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to go out and tell people they can be restored in a relationship with God through Christ. He says in verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And then he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so, today, we don't start in Jerusalem. Today, we're an ambassador wherever we live. Today, the whole world is our mission field. It's right across the street here. Doesn't have to be India, China. It's right here. And we are ambassador for Christ. And we are to tell them the good news that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. That's the message we are to have today. Amen? And what message is it? It's Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel was different from these 12 here. He says this in Romans 2.16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And then he says this in Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. My gospel is part of a secret that God had, it's called the mystery, the body of Christ, and it's through the gospel of grace that I participate in this. That's Paul's gospel. And Paul didn't receive it a man. He received it by direct revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And his message is the gospel of grace. He says this, as part of this mystery program, his gospel, Ephesians 3.9 and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. He says in Romans 16, 26, now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel, uh, verse 26, that's verse 25, if you would. Verse 26, okay, thank you. 
It's a great verse. I want you to get it. Verse 26. Help me out, guys. Come on. I'll, re I'll look it up myself. You got it? Okay, thank you. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of everlasting God made known to all nations for the... And that's not what I wanted, okay? Oh, it says for the obedience of what? Of faith. Not the obedience of the law. Not the obedience of the commandments. But this mystery gospel, Paul's gospel, is by faith. And that's completely different from anything else. Now, what is the grace gospel that's for today? What is it that saves a person today? I need to know that I'm a sinner, of course, I can't save myself. But I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Christ died for my sins. He was buried. And he rose again the third day. And that, and that alone, nothing else, is enough Sufficient to save one for all eternity. Amen? It's not how many tears I cry. It's not if I get goosebumps going up and down my neck. It's my faith in that truth. Now, I put these verses here to close out, but I just want you to see about our gospel today. He states in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And, but, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel right there, people. The gospel of grace. He says in Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I believe and Christ and that gospel message, and Christ gives me his righteousness. He states in Romans 5, 8 through 10, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's the death, burial, and resurrection right there. My faith in that, that alone. He says in Romans 3, 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his Grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ has paid everything necessary to be able to wash away our sins and give us eternal life. That alone. If you trust your church membership, you trust how many tears you shed, if you trust being baptized, if you trust trying to live a good life to save you, you're still lost. Because it's your faith alone in that gospel alone that saves you. He says in Romans 10, 9, very simple, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Does God lie? And hope of eternal life which God that promised that cannot lie. He says in verse 9, or verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It means I, I'm sincere about it. I believe this truth because the Bible says it's true. I believe that with all my heart and I ask Christ to save me. It's that simple. Then he says this in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Philippians 3, 9 says this, and being found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, that doesn't say, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When I put my faith in Christ and the gospel, he gives me his righteousness that makes me accepted in the beloved. 
The reason I know I'm saved, I'm in the blood. And since I'm in the blood, I have his righteousness. And when the Father sees me, he sees the righteousness of Christ wrapped around me, and I'm accepted because I'm in his beloved Son. Amen? Galatians 3, 26. For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Pretty simple, isn't it? And then he says, in, and uh, I'll skip those verses if you don't mind. And uh, Romans 10, 13, if you would. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever that believes this with their heart shall call, that means pray or to ask, upon the name of the Lord, because ye believe this message, shall be saved. Now, I went over those verses very, very simple. Because in a day and age in which we're living, it is a privilege to be in this age today. The mystery of the body of Christ, the gospel of grace today. I'm glad I'm not under law. I'm glad I'm not going into tribulation. <laughs> today, we have such a wonderful salvation. And all the denominations and the evangelists that goes crisscross across this country that tells us there's more than that gospel are liars. They are not telling you the truth. The truth is found in Christ and Christ alone. He's the Son of God. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again. And if I believe that with my heart, I believe it. I ask him, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself, but I do believe your son died for my sins and they buried him and the third day he rose again. God, I'm not trusting anything else. That alone am I putting my faith in. God, I believe. And when I do that, whether I do it vocally, audibly, or within my heart, it's at that moment, bam, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. These things have I written unto you that believe upon the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have everlasting life. It's a present possession, and you get it the very moment heart faith acts based on that message. That's when you get saved. 2 Peter 1.9 says this, and I close. For if these things be in you, growing in the Lord, the things, and abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He expects us to grow. But he that lacketh these things, if I'm not growing like I ought to, these things is blind and cannot see afar off. He doesn't have much faith. Now get this. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It's possible for us Christians to walk in this life and forget the experience of salvation. You know, I was glad they say, take me back, the song they were singing, take me back. Never, ever get over being saved. It's the greatest, most important decision that ever takes place in the heart and life of an individual person. Because it's that gospel message that saves you, that guarantees you. He will walk with you every day in this life, but he also seals you to guarantee you delivery for the next life. That means that you won't have to go through the tribulation. That means you will not have to stand before the white throne judgment one day and hear the words and you go to hell. And hell is real regardless of what the modern preachers are trying to tell us today. It is a real literal fire in torment forever. But it's this gospel message, Paul's gospel, that saves a person for all eternity and promises us that we're going to live with Christ in heaven one day. Amen? Now, I don't know about you. Let's stop, let's stop forgetting this great salvation. What a wonderful privilege we have to be during this period of time. Now, I know this period of time has been going on some 2,000 years. You talk about the long-suffering and the patience of God. 
because he's not willing that any should perish? He's given mankind the opportunity to be able to be saved. But one day that door is going to shut. And when Christ says to us, the body of Christ, come up, we're going up, people. And then this tribulation period, and you can't get saved the same way you did back here. You revert back here, and you're going to have to go through Israel in order to be saved. So today is a day of salvation. This moment, if you would believe and ask him to save you. Father, we love you. We thank you for the gospel of grace. We're thankful that everything necessary for our total salvation, complete, we are complete in Christ. And Lord, we're thankful for your son who loved us, who came, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then an old rugged cross took our punishment, our penalty for our sins. And you judged our sins up on your son's body on the cross and he paid for our sins. And then they died, and he shed his blood, and they buried him. But the grave could not hold him. He came forth as conqueror to live again three days later. Today he's on your right hand seated, and he's calling out, will you believe in me? Will you believe this gospel message that I've given to you in my word? And I just pray if there's somebody here this morning who's never been saved, I just pray that they would see us before they leave this morning. And then, Lord, for those of us who have been saved, make our salvation experience fresh and anew again. May we never, ever get over this wonderful reconciliation, this wonderful transaction that took place the day we put our faith in you. And so God, remind us, help us not to allow the world and the cares of this world to silence you out of our life any longer. May we say, God, I want you to be first in my love. Give us the passion that we need, God, and we'll praise you for that. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around, I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning. You would say, I want to be saved. I want to be saved by grace and I believe this story of Christ, of him dying for me and rising for me. And I'm not saved this morning, but with my heart this morning, I want to believe that. And you say, that's my heart's desire. I'm going to say a very simple prayer. Saying the prayer doesn't save you unless you mean it in your heart. But if you mean it, you can be saved this very moment. Just say this prayer right there where you are. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I do believe Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sins, shed his blood, was buried. Three days later, he arose. The best way I know how, God, I tell you this morning, I believe. I believe this gospel with all my heart, and I mean it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I always do this, just a source of encouragement for our people, but for you. And you would say, Pastor Jim, and we don't come out and pull you for it. We don't do that. But we always give you an opportunity not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If you just pray that prayer in your heart and you man it, just by an uplifted hand you would say, I just want you to know I prayed that prayer and I meant it. I'd like for you to just lift your hand right now. Just go and lift your hand right now. Yes, God bless you, sir. Yes, ma'am, God bless you. Yes, ma'am, in the middle. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, over here to my side there. God bless you. Father, thank you for making salvation so simple, so just understandable that a child can understand it. but we know it cost you greatly. And so God, just be with these people. May you become real. May they begin to seek us out so they can grow now in their faith. Lord, we just want to tell you one more time, we love you, we adore you, we glorify you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? I'm going to go on and just dismiss you. I'm not going to sing a song of invitation this morning, okay? 
and I'm going to go and dismiss you. Uh, let me just say this to you. If you prayed that prayer, I have some booklets here that uh, help you in your new walk in Christ. And it's a great little booklet. And I have them here. Just come and say, I'd like to have one of those booklets, and I'll give it to you, okay? We love you. We'll see you tonight. God bless you.